on this day I want to tell you about, which will be almost a thousand years from now. They were a boy, a girl, and a love story. Now, although I haven't said much so far, none of it is true. The boy was not what you and I would normally think of as a boy because he was 187 years old. Nor was the girl a girl for other reasons. And the love story did not entail that sublimation of the urge to rape and concurrent postponement of the instinct to submit, which we at present understand in such matters. You won't care much for this story if you don't grasp these facts at once. If, however, you will make the effort, you'll likely enough find a jam-packed, chock-full, and tip-top crammed with laughter, tears, and poignant sentiment, which may or may not be worthwhile. The reason the girl was not a girl was that she was a boy. How angrily you recoil from the page. You say, who the hell wants to read about a pair of queers? Calm yourself. Here are no hot-breathing secrets of perversion for the coterie trade. In fact, if you were to see this girl, you would not guess that she was in any sense a boy. Breasts, too. Reproductive organs, female. Hips, calipigian. Face, hairless. Superorbital lobes, non-existent. You would term her female on sight, although it is true that you might wonder just what species she was a female of, being confused by the tail, the silky pelt, and the gill slits behind each ear. Now you recoil again. Cripes man, take my word for it. This is a sweet kid, and if you, as a normal male, spent as much as an hour in a room with her, you would bend heaven and earth to get her into the sack. Dora, we will call her that, her name was Omicron dibase, seven group Tatarut esteratus 5314, the last which is a color specification corresponding to a shade of green. Dora, I say, was feminine, charming, and cute. I admit she doesn't sound that way. She was, as you might put it, a dancer. Her art involved qualities of intellection and expertise of a very high order, requiring both tremendous natural capacities and endless practice. It was performed in null gravity, and I can best describe it by saying that it was something like the performance of a contortionist and something like classical ballet, maybe resembling Danilova's dying swan. It was also pretty damned sexy. In a symbolic way, to be sure, but face it, most of the things we call sexy are symbolic, you know, except perhaps an exhibitionist's open clothing. On Day Million, when Dora danced, the people who saw her panted, and you would too. About this business of her being a boy, it didn't matter to her audiences that genetically she was male. It wouldn't matter to you if you were among them because you wouldn't know it, not unless you took a biopsy cutting of her flesh and put it under an electron microscope to find the XY chromosome. And it didn't matter to them because they didn't care. Through techniques which are not only complex but haven't yet been discovered, these people were able to determine a great deal about the aptitudes and easements of babies quite a long time before they were born. At about the second horizon of cell division, to be exact, when the segmenting egg is becoming a free blastocyst. And then they naturally helped those aptitudes along. Wouldn't we? If we find a child with an aptitude for music, we give them a scholarship to Juilliard. If they found a child whose aptitudes were being a woman, they made him one. As sex had long been dissociated from reproduction, this was relatively easy to do and caused no trouble and no, or at least very little, comment. How much is very little? Oh, about as much as would be caused by our own tampering with divine will by filling a tooth, less than would be caused by wearing a hearing aid. Does it still sound awful? Then look closely at the next busty babe you meet and reflect that she may be a Dora, for adults who are genetically male but somatically female are far from unknown even in our own time. An accident of environment in the womb overwhelms the blueprints of heredity. The difference is that with us it happens only by accident. We don't know about it except rarely after close study. Whereas the people of Day Million did it often on purpose because they wanted to. Well, that's enough to tell you about Dora. It would only confuse you to add that she was seven feet tall and smelled of peanut butter. Let us begin our story. On day million, Dora swam out of her house, entered a transportation tube, was sucked briskly to the surface in its flow of water and ejected in its plume of spray to an elastic platform in front of her, um, call it her rehearsal hall. 
Oh, hell, she cried in pretty confusion, reaching out to catch her balance and finding herself tumbled against a total stranger whom we will call Don. They met cute. Don was on his way to have his legs renewed. Love was the farthest thing from his mind. But when absentmindedly taking a shortcut across the landing platform for a submarine heights and finding himself drenched, he discovered his arms full of the loveliest girl he had ever seen. He knew at once they were meant for each other. Will you marry me, he asked. She said softly, Wednesday. And the promise was like a caress. Don was tall, muscular, bronze, and exciting. His name was no more Don than Torres was Dora, but the personal part of it was Adonis in tribute to his vibrant maleness, and so we will call him Don for short. His personality color code in angstrom units was 5290, or only a few degrees bluer than Torres' 5314, a measure of what they had intuitively discovered at first sight that they possessed many affinities of taste and interest. I despair of telling you exactly what it was that Don did for a living. I don't mean for the sake of making money. I mean for the sake of giving purpose and meaning to his life to keep him from going off his nut with boredom, except to say that it involved a lot of traveling. He traveled in interstellar spaceships. In order to make a spaceship go really fast, about 31 male and seven genetically female human beings had to do certain things, and Don was one of the 31. Actually, he contemplated options. This involved a lot of exposure to radiation flux, not so much from his own station in the propulsive system as in the spillover from the next stage where genetic female preferred selections. And the subnuclear particles making the selections she preferred demolished themselves in a shower of quanta. Well, you don't give a rat's ass for that, but it meant that Don had to be clad at all times in a skin of light, resilient, extremely strong, copper-colored metal. I've already mentioned this, but you probably thought I meant he was sunburned. More than that, he was a cybernetic man. Most of his ruder parts had long since been replaced with mechanisms of vastly more permanence and use. A cadmium centrifuge, not a heart, pumped his blood. His lungs moved only when he wanted to speak out loud, for a cascade of osmotic filters rebreathed oxygen out of his own wastes. In a way, he probably would have looked peculiar to a man from the 20th century with his glowing eyes and seven-fingered hands. But to himself, and of course to Dora, he looked mighty manly and grand. In the course of his voyages, Don had circled Proxima Centauri, Procyon, and the puzzling worlds of Miraciti. He had carried agricultural templates to the planets of Canopus, and brought back warm, witty pets from the pale companion of Aldebaran. Blue hot or red cool, he had seen a thousand stars and their 10,000 planets. He had, in fact, been traveling the star lanes with only brief leaves on Earth for pushing two centuries. But you don't care about that either. It is people who make stories, not the circumstances they find themselves in. And you want to hear about these two people. Well, they made it. The great thing they had for each other grew and flowered and burst into fruition on Wednesday, just as Dora had promised. They met at the encoding room with a couple of well-wishing friends of peace to cheer them on. And while their identities were being taped and stirred, they smiled and whispered to each other and bore the jokes of their friends with blushing repartee. Then they exchanged their mathematical analogs and went away, Dora to her, dwelling beneath the surface of the sea, and Don to his ship. It was an idol, really. They lived happily ever after. Or anyway, until they decided not to bother anymore and died. Of course, they never set eyes on each other again.